Hi, welcome back. Now that we've talked about the three big financial statements, the income statement, the balance sheet, the statement of cash flows, it's time to do some cleaning up. So cleaning up in what sense? Well, let's face it, accountants like order, they like consistency, and that's why they write all the rules that they do. But much of accounting as we know it was developed in the 20th century. It was developed for manufacturing firms. And as the economies have shifted away from manufacturing to technology and service-related businesses, accountants have had a tough job keeping up. And many of the inconsistencies you see in accounting reflect the shift away in the economy. In this session, I'd like to talk about four issues. The first is taxes and how they report in financial statements. The second is management compensation, the form of stock and options. The third is commitments that might not qualify as direct debt, but have the same features. They're contractual commitments you've got to make in good times and bad times. And finally, investments that you make for the long term. That should really be capital expenditures that, for whatever reason, get treated as operating expenses. Let's start with taxes. One reason there's so much confusion around taxes, there are lots of different tax rates floating around. In fact, broadly speaking, there are three different tax rates you can compute for a company. The first is a marginal tax rate. This is a tax rate that's in your tax codes. So if you're a U.S. company and you make all of your income in the U.S., starting in 2017 after that last tax reform act, your marginal tax rate should have been 21% at the federal level. And on top of that, you get state and local taxes, you'd end up with about 24 to 25%. That's a marginal tax rate. See, so all U.S. companies have to pay that, right? Not necessarily. And here's why. If you're a multinational, you make your income in multiple countries. Remember, you get tax where you make your income, not where you're incorporated. You might have to care about the marginal tax rates in those countries as well. So the marginal tax rate is in the tax code. The effective tax rate is the tax rate closer to the, closest to the accountant's heart. Because here's how it's computed. You go to the income statement, you should take the tax line item, taxes due, divide by the taxable income, you get an effective tax rate. You think that must be what companies pay, right? Well, remember, income statement is an accrual statement. It reflects accrual income and accrual taxes. It might not reflect actual taxes pay. So the third, third tax rate. You go to your tax books. You look at what you wrote out as a check as taxes, that's cash taxes. You divide by income, you get a cash tax rate. Do those three numbers, marginal tax rate, effective tax rate, and cash tax rate have to converge? Not necessarily, at least not in the near term. In fact, let's think about what happens when the numbers diverge. For most companies, the effective tax rate will be lower than the marginal tax rate. For two reasons. One is, if you're a multinational, you make income in other countries with lower tax rates, your marginal tax rate on average will be lower than the marginal tax rate in your domestic, in, in, in the country where you're listed. The second is you can adopt legally tax deferral and avoidance strategies. Notice the word legal. I'm not talking about companies breaking the law. I'm saying staying within the tax law. When there is a difference between what is expensed and reported as taxable income and you're reporting in tax books, and it's perfectly legal to have two sets of books, there will be a difference in taxes as well. What you see as taxes in the income statement might not match up to what the company pays out as taxes, actually. That difference shows up as a deferred tax. In fact, it builds up over time, either as an asset. If you consistently pay more in taxes in your cash tax books than you report in your, I'm sorry, in more in if you report more in taxes in your reporting books than you pay in taxes, or as a liability, if you pay, if you consistently report less. So when you see deferred tax assets and liabilities, it reflects the fact that what you see as taxes in your income statement might not reflect what you pay in taxes. And as I mentioned earlier in the context of balance sheets, deferred tax assets and liabilities are really neither assets nor liabilities. They're reflections of expectations of taxes in the future. If you have a deferred tax asset, you will have to pay less taxes in the future than a company that doesn't have it. If you have a deferred tax liability, you will pay more in taxes. So one final point about taxes before we move on. If you're a money losing company, you obviously don't have to pay taxes. But you're also allowed to take those losses and carry them forward. That care, or in some cases, carry them backwards. But let's take the easiest scenario of carrying them forward. You can carry them forward. Why? Because you're allowed to take that loss and set it off against income in a future year. So let's say you lose money this year. You lose money next year, but you make money the year after. The year that you make money, you're allowed to claim the net operating losses you carried forward from the previous years. 
In fact, you're a company that moves from making money to losing money to making money. You're even allowed to carry the NOL backwards for two years and forward 20 years. So when you look at a company that's money losing, one of the things you might want to check on is whether there's an NOL and how much that NOL is because it will affect your tax payments in the future. So with taxes, be careful. What you see as taxes paid in your income statement might not reflect what the company actually pays. But the giveaway will be to look in the statement of cash flows because there I will have to reflect the difference. How? If I pay a hundred, if I claim to pay a hundred thousand in taxes on my income statement, I really pay a hundred and fifty thousand. I've got to show the extra fifty thousand as a cash outflow in my statement of cash flows. So combining the income statement with the statement of cash flows will give you a sense of taxes. Now let's move on to stock based compensation. Until the 1980s, stock-based compensation was rare. Maybe a couple of people got it. But starting in the 90s, stock-based compensation became much more common. And there are two motivations for stock-based compensation. One is to align the interests of employees and managers that think like stockholders. But here's the bigger reason. You know why stock-based compensation took off in the 90s? Because a lot of young companies that were losing money that couldn't afford to pay cash salaries to their employees, so they paid them with stock. So when you think about stock-based compensation, think about why companies are using it. For the most part, they're doing it because they don't have the cash to pay their employees. And stock-based compensation can take two forms. It can take the form of options to buy shares at a fixed price in the future, or it can be restricted stock where you're given shares, but you're not allowed to trade those shares. That's a restriction on those shares. So when you think about stock-based compensation, let's be quite clear. If you have, you know, if, if your motive is to align employee interests with, with, uh, with those of stockholders, maybe you can argue that this is not an expense. But to the extent that you're paying with stock to keep employees working for you, it has to be treated as, a, as employee compensation. And employee compensation is an operating expense. So I think it's very difficult to make the argument that stock-based compensation is not an expense, especially for companies where it's a consistent line item year after year after year. And to expense stock-based compensation, the rules have changed. It turned out that pre-2004, companies, when they granted options, were treated as giving away nothing because accountants valued options at exercise value. What that means is if you granted options where the strike price was equal to the stock price, the accountant said, that's not a big deal. You gave away nothing, which makes absolutely no sense, but they did it. But starting in 2004, companies have been required to actually come up with the actual item of the expense by valuing the options in the restricted stock at the time that they're granted. So if you look at income statements for US companies or European companies today, the, these companies, if they give employees compensation in the form of stock or options, will show a line item. And then that line item reflects the value of that grant at the time of the grant. So it's clearly an operating expense now. But let's ask the most subtle question. Is it a cash flow? At first sight, you think, of course, it's not a cash flow. It's a shares. But think about the difference between stock-based compensation and depreciation. Depreciation is a non-cash expense, but you can add it back. There's nothing behind it. Options and restricted stock are more a payment in kind than a non-cash expense, right? And because you don't have the cash, you're giving away a piece of the company. So while companies are cavalier about adding back stock-based compensation to come up with cash flows, I think they should be less so. Because there is a big difference between adding back depreciation and adding back stock-based compensation. I personally believe that when I compute the cash flows for a company, I should not be adding back stock-based compensation to get to that cash flow because you've given away a slice of my equity. If I'm an equity investor in the company, when you gave that compensation. So bottom line on stock-based compensation, right now the rule is when you grant the compensation, it's going to be treated as an expense. And my suggestion to you is treat it as an expense. Don't fall for the trap of it's not a cash flow, therefore I can add it back. Let's move on to other debt commitments that are not debt. Let's take a, a retail company. It decides to open a new store. And here's how it does it. It goes and signs a 10-year lease in a mall. Remember what that contract requires. It requires the company to make lease payments every year for the next 10 years. It's a contractual commitment. They've got to make those payments in good years. They've got to make them in bad years. To me, there's no difference between a lease commitment and going to the bank and borrowing money on a 10-year term loan. So to me, there's never been a debate about whether leases should be debt. They're, of course, they're debt. 
But until 2019, accountants danced a very strange dance. They said, if you don't have ownership, and they made ownership the center of their decision making. If you don't have ownership of an asset, they said, we won't treat these lease, com if you have ownership, we'll treat these lease commitments as debt. But if you don't have ownership, we will not treat it as debt. The former were called capital leases. The latter were, call, were called operating leases. So until 2019, U.S. companies would show capital leases as debt and operating leases as operating expenses. Outside the U.S., it was even worse. All lease commitments are often treated as operating lease expenses. So a financing expense was treated as an operating expense. That made no sense. And until 2019, I would clean up and I'll show you the process of cleaning up to make those lease commitments into debt. In 2019, accounting came to its senses, and now all lease commitments are treated as debt. So instead of dividing up debt into capital and operating leases, now you see all lease debt show up in balance sheets. Now we say, how do they do it? It's actually pretty simple. Here are the steps. To convert lease commitments to debt, you start with your contractual lease commitments for the future, not expected lease payments, contractual lease commitments. Then you take the present value of these lease commitments using your pre-tax cost of borrowing. So based on your default risk and interest rates today, you say, how much would it cost me to borrow money? Use that pre-tax cost of borrowing. You discount the lease commitments back to the present. That present value becomes the lease debt. You show that as debt. Now your balance sheet has to balance. So here's what you need to do. You need to create a counter asset because your balance sheet will not balance otherwise. And once you create a counter asset, you've got to do what you do with other assets. You've got to depreciate and amortize over time. In other words, if you decide to do this, you've got to go the distance. And once you do this, remember your operating income will have to get restated as well, because right now your operating income is after lease expense. You now add the lease expense back saying, it's a financing expense, not an operating expense. And you subtract out the depreciation you're going to get on the leased asset. You see, what a pain in the neck. We'll talk about doing this. The mechanics are not difficult, but basically contractual commitments are treated as debt because they're fixed payments you've got to make in good times and bad times. Now, that's accountants have come to their senses with lease commitments, but lease commitments are just the tip of the iceberg. There are other contractual commitments that share many of the features as leases and should really be treated like this. So if you're a manufacturing firm and you have purchase commitments for the next five years, it's debt. Company like Netflix, the content commitments, the five-year contract you have to show Seinfeld for the next five years is, is the equivalent of debt. If you're a sports team, hey, Barcelona, and you sign Messi to five years, it's a contractual payment, it's debt. So what I said about leases applies to any contractual commitments. Which brings me to my final cleaning up. Now, if you think about accounting 101, we were told that if you have an expense that creates benefits only this year, it's an operating expense. If you have an expense that creates benefits over many years, it's a capital expense. And if I apply that logic, there is no way that R&D should ever be an operating expense. What company in its right mind does R&D because it expects to get a benefit this year? It expects to get a benefit next year, two years out, five years out, 10 years out. It's really super capex. Now, counting will push back saying it's too uncertain, but we've never used uncertainty as a dividing line on any other type of capital expenditure. If I build a factory to produce a product where I'm uncertain about the market, you don't let me expense that factory. So when R&D is, is not capitalized, the argument that it's too uncertain doesn't make sense. We're also told that it's just being conservative. That's not true. When you treat R&D as an operating expense, you're taking your biggest assets off the books because you're not showing it on your balance sheet. That doesn't strike me as conservative. So let's be real. R&D is a capital expense. There is no contesting it. And to capitalize R&D, here are the three steps. First, and this is the toughest step, you have to specify an amortizable life. How many years does it take between the time you do R&D and a commercial product emerges. Obviously, this will vary across sectors, maybe three in technology and 10 in pharmaceuticals. Step two, you collect your R&D expenses from past years. So you have a three-year amortizable life. You collect R&D expenses from the last three years. You're saying, why? Because I've got to act like I've been capitalizing R&D all the way through. And you're saying, what am I going to do with the R&D from three years ago? Remember, if R&D has a three-year life, the R&D expense from three years ago would have been spread out over three years. Let's keep it simple and use straight line depreciation, write it off over three years. Keep track of two things. One is how much of that expense is being written off this year, how much is still left over. 
The amount that's being written off this year will be like amortization. It'll show up as an expense. The amount that's not been written off from previous years will now show up in your balance sheet. For lack of a better word, let's call it capital invested in R&D. And when you do this, you also have to adjust your earnings. Why? Because right now you're subtracting R&D to get to those earnings. I'm going to add the R&D back and then I have to subtract out the amortization I'd had, the R&D expense. You can see that your entire perspective on a company can change when you make these shifts. And this again is just the tip of the iceberg because there are other expenses and other businesses that fit the R&D profile. Exploration costs of an oil company, advertising expenses to build a brand name at a consumer product company, recruiting and training expenses at a consulting company, customer acquisition costs for a subscriber-based company. What I did with R&D has to be done there as well because if you do not do this, you're going to get a skewed vision of what these businesses are worth, how much they're investing, what they're truly making. The bottom line is accounting statements reflect an accounting view of the world and that accounting view was set or created during a very different century with a very different economy. It's your job and my job when we use accounting statements to take that raw data and mold it, adjust it, adapt it to what our needs are. So as we go through financial analysis, have no qualms about breaking accounting rules if you will get a number that's more meaningful for your company. I hope you found the session useful. And thank you very much for listening.